when you look back at how we as a collective community have responded and reacted to various injustices, it says a lot about our current capabilities as a nation to be able to withstand or combat the very evils and difficulties and trials that we face. Going back to the days of enslavement, it is awkward that all across the Caribbean region there were 62 slave rebellions in 21 different Caribbean countries, but not one slave rebellion in Trinidad. There were four in Tobago, three in the 1700s and one in the 1800s. And they list one as in Trinidad, 1837, the Dagger Revolt, but slavery had already ended and we were in the apprenticeship period, so that doesn't really count. So all across the Caribbean, places like Jamaica had over 10 slave rebellions, one lasting for 10 whole years. Places like Cuba and Martinique with four and five different uprisings. Places like Barbados and St. Lucia, Antigua, St. Kitts with so much revolutionary activity against the injustices and oppression and exploitation of slavery, but none in Trinidad. But after slavery was over, this society began to transform somewhat, and we began to see a new kind of spirit coming up out of our people. Because, of course, full emancipation took place on August the 1st, 1838, and then by August the 1st, 1839, we began celebrating the Candlelight. And the Cambalay was a festival that commemorated the Canis Brulis procedure where we used to light the cane fields on fire to get rid of the snakes and the locusts and the vermin. And then out the fires to protect the sugar cane. But then there was a threat by the enslaved to keep the fires lit and then burn down the slave master's plantation. And then when we would commemorate that activity, the Cambalay became a revolutionary festival. And so 1839, 1840, 1841, 1842, all the way up to the 1880s, where there were now riots in the Cambalay, and the British took a position to ban our African celebration as it was, and in particular to ban the African drum. Imagine banning African people from playing African drums. But after they did that in the 1880s and we went into the bamboo patch, cut out the bamboos, created the tambu bamboo, and from the tambu bamboo, the steel drum. But it was around that time as well that they merged the African Canboulet Festival with that of the French Catholic Carnival, the Dimash Gras and the Mardi Gras leading up to Ash Wednesday, Carne meaning meet, valet meaning farewell, the carnival was goodbye to meet before the 40 day period of fasting for Lent. But the idea was to suppress the consciousness that was coming out of the festival, to suppress the message of liberation that was being taught through the songs, through the music, through the culture of the people. Our first known calypso at a time when we were speaking French, not English, in the 1800s was a song called Ne de Pas Six Ans. The Calypsonian was Gros Jean. And this meant we don't want another six years as a protest song for the apprenticeship that they proposed for us as slaves. So when the 1880s came, you saw a kind of cultural transformation and an attempt to weaken the positivity of the message that was coming out and replace it with an entertainment-oriented kind of entertainment, music, dance, drama, stick fighting, etc. But in 1888, when the 50th anniversary of emancipation came about, that great attorney, Emmanuel Mzumbo Lazari, planned 50-year anniversary celebrations for emancipation, which were massive in Trinidad. But it also, again, took time, took part at a place when they were trying to clamp down on ideas coming out through culture. And so, remember, we had absolutely no slave rebellions on the island of Trinidad. We had absolutely no violent uprisings in Trinidad, four in Tobago, and several all across the Caribbean. But around that 1880s period is where we really began to turn and transform. Because not only did we have the Cambalay riots occurring a number of times in the 1880s, 
Also on October the 30th, 1884, there was the Muharram Massacre, which today is known as the Husay Riots, where in South Trinidad, a number of people were slaughtered. And then this uprising began to send waves of concern throughout the nation. And then look at what began to happen. March 23rd, 1903, there were the water riots where in Port of Spain, right across from where Woodford Square is today, which was Brunswick Square back then, they burnt the Red House, set it afire. The colonial police shot into the crowd, injuring hundreds of people, murdering 16 in cold blood, right there at Woodford Square. And then there was a commission of inquiry to see why it was that the people rose up in rebellion and burned down the seat of the government building. On July the 19th, 1919 after the end of world war one there was a celebration in the queen's park savannah for the black men from trinidad who fought for the british in world war one and on that day hundreds of men came out it also broke out into a riot because these men came back from the war and were treated like second-class citizens in a society where they were still unable to get employment, still unable to enjoy human rights and civil rights. And of course, this paved the way for Captain Arthur Cipriani, who said he was representing the barefoot man, starting and taking over and continuing the work of the Trinidad Working Men's Association. But in that same year, 1919, in the month of November, there was the waterfront riots. The same place where Hyatt Hotel is today and the Parliament have their meetings on the seat of the waterfront. There were dreadful conditions for the men who used to work on the port, some who had to go almost a mile out to bring goods back in. And riot broke out twice in that year, 1919. And you saw the spirit of rebellion beginning to rise up in the consciousness of Trinidad and Tobago. A major milestone year was 1925 when there was partial adult suffrage and then 1946 when there was full adult suffrage but something very significant happened in between there which of course was the oil field uprising but what they don't tell you in the history of Trinidad and Tobago and in the history of the Caribbean in general is that while Uriah Buzz Butler was leading a movement among the oil field workers and now of course we celebrate June the 19th as Labor Day as a result of what happened with the killing of Charlie King at that junction in Faisalabad. What they don't tell you through the educational system is that all over the Caribbean at the same time these riots, revolutions and rebellions were taking place. In St. Vincent they destroyed the courthouse building in Kingstown. In Belize there was a march of 2,000 people called the Unemployed Brigade in Belize City. In Barbados, in Bridgetown, you had Clement Payne traveling back and forth between Trinidad and Barbados, leading a struggle over there. You had Elma Francois from St. Vincent, who was also a key activist in both Trinidad and Tobago, with influence in St. Vincent. In Jamaica, their first Prime Minister, Alexander Bustamante, he, as a trade union leader earlier, also encouraged uprisings against the system. But what was it? that caused all of these movements to take place simultaneously in the mid-1930s. And it was the fact that we were sensitive to the 100-year anniversary of emancipation. By the fact that slavery was long gone, done and over with, as far as a formal system is concerned, we were revisiting our relationship with the working conditions in the society at that time, and we came forth with this spirit of rebellion, this spirit of revolution. And so simultaneously, all across the region, we saw those uprisings. And it was after that, the British held a commission of inquiry to find out why all of these black people were engaging in this kind of rebellious activity. And then the commission of inquiry, which was called the Moyne Commission, came to the conclusion that in order to prevent these riots from occurring over and over again, that we must give the masses the right to vote. And so said, so done. When they passed full adult suffrage in 1946, and now every single citizen of this country had the right to vote, it was from there that the attention to the colonial authorities was redirected 
the rage and anger against the system with its discrimination, its classism, its racism, and its modern day segregation at that time. All of the anger that we would have had naturally to the system was now redirected to other competing political parties. This was wisdom on the part of the old colonial master. Because the same way that they used indentureship to create a rift between the majority African and Indian populations to take attention away from the colonial authorities that were the overseers of both slavery and indentureship. The creation of a political party system competing for a general election brought about a new kind of previously unseen rivalry.